Good afternoon. I am Roberto Fontoni, a senior partner with McKinsey and Company, and I am honored to be here with you uh, today. Uh, infrastructure is usually at the top of uh, mayor's priority agenda, and they are right. Uh, infrastructure investments have the potential not only to increase economic activity in the short term, but also to foster productivity in the long term. Uh, our research shows that infrastructure investments have returns of 20 times its initial cost. Yet, in the last five years, infrastructure investment across the Americas have decreased on a relative basis. Why is that happening? What can we do to reverse that trend? And to discuss those topics, I, I welcome May, uh, Mayor Miner uh, and Mayor Weaver to the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll start with, with Flint. Um, possibly no other city better illustrate the challenge of balancing the emergency issues with long-term planning. In that context, how do you prioritize your investments and, and your pipeline of ideas? Well, you know, uh, that's a really, really good question. And I'm going to answer that, and I hope nobody else prioritizes the way we've had to prioritize in Flint. <laughs> Let me start by saying that, because not only is there an infrastructure crisis, and that's something that we're facing all across the country because of uh, the lack of investing and maintaining infrastructure, but we're having to prioritize in a reactionary basis because we're, we're doing this as a public health crisis. Uh, because we have a city that's been contaminated with lead, poisoned with lead. And so the way we're, pr we're prioritizing is quite different, and I'm hoping that people are learning from Flint and they don't have to do things in the same manner that we've had to do them. So uh, what we are looking at as far as prioritizing what we do with infrastructure is we've had to look at where we have a high concentration of homes that have the lead and the galvanized pipes, mm -hmm. and then where we have a high concentration of children under the age of six and elderly. So that's been uh, what we're doing, and that's been the first thing. And then one of the other things that we found out is that we have some areas and we, uh, that test extremely high for lead, even though we've been trying to treat the pipes and recoat the pipes, and the, the numbers are going down in certain areas, there are some places in the city where we have not been able to fix that. And so that's the other priority level that we've had to do as far as how we're addressing our infrastructure issue. Um, the other thing we had to look at were where we had the elementary schools and making sure we not only did the uh, lead service lines that are around the schools, but looking at the infrastructure that are in those school buildings and making sure that we were taking those out and replacing those with more updated fixtures. And that's a part that people have to take in mind too is when you're looking at the infrastructure, is looking at what are, what's the makeup of the fixtures that are in those homes as well and attract the necessary funding for all that? You know, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a tough one for us because in Flint we're in a peculiar situation. And uh, some people, I don't know if everybody knows that we have been under an emergency manager system for six years. And while uh, things are changing in Flint, we're not quite back to home rule yet. So uh, we still have a receiver transition advisory board that is uh, by, led by the state to oversee the financial aspects and decisions that are being made. And while I understand that, it's really slowed down our process of looking at how we do this. Because usually what would happen is we budget, we watch our money, we're making sure we're not uh, getting change orders, all of those kinds of things to make sure we stay within the, the budget that's allowed, and then hand it off to city council to vote and pass it on. But now we are getting money uh, in small buckets as far as replacing infrastructure. So we have 25 million to spend, which is only going to replace about 5,000 lead service lines, but we're getting it in $5 million buckets. So after $5 million, we have to rebid, then it goes back to city council, and then depending on when that meeting was, we have a two week to a month time frame where it still has to go to that receiver transition advisory board. So it's really slowed down the process of looking at how are we doing this and how are we doing it in a way that makes sense and looking at the money. So right now we're still waiting on those kinds of funds to come from the state and federal government. I see, I see. So if, if one, in one hand we need to prioritize our investments, on the other hand we need to make the most out of the infrastructure that we already have. 
And I know that Syracuse have been working on a few innovative ideas on how to increase efficiency and improve the, the quality of the services that we provide to, to the citizens. Could you share some of the, those ideas and see what we can replicate elsewhere? Sure. Well, I just want to back up with what Karen said about that. You hit the key question. So what about resources and how do you get those? You know, it wasn't too long ago when the federal government would provide 70 percent and then the um, state government would provide 23 percent and the local government would provide 7 percent. And that stopped a number of years ago and the infrastructure didn't just break apart the year that that stopped, but you now see, particularly in older cities like Syracuse is, um, that this infrastructure is deteriorating. And so while I have been an advocate for saying we need more resources and you have to meet your obligations, federal and state government, at the local government level, we have always believed we can't say, no, we'll figure that problem out later. We have to figure out how to do it now. And so what we have done is engage this effort um, with uh, the support of Bluebird Philanthropies and uh, an innovation team to use data. And the data that we have as a city, um, most cities have lots and lots of data, to use that data to have a way to predict where our infrastructure is going to break down or where we can maintain it in a cost-effective manner. So mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, we have put sensors in, our water, in some of our water mains that can then, on a 24-hour basis, send data back to us to show us within three inches where some of our water mains are leaking. So then we can look at those leaks and say, is this a big leak? Is it going to lead to a catastrophic water main break such that we need to repair it right away? Or can we wait a couple of months until it's spring or summer so it's not as expensive to get into, uh, into the road? When we do road repairs, we can say, you know, let's look at this three-dimensionally. So we do the road repair, we ask the utility company to repair the utility line, and we do the water main um, at the same time. We worked together with the University of Chicago and the uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt Data for Social Good to produce an algorithm that will actually predict where our water mains are going to break in the next three to five years, or where the most vulnerable ones are. So that again, when we start taking what finite resources we have as a city, mm -hmm. and when we invest them in our infrastructure, we're making sure that our return on that investment, we're pushing it as far out as possible so that we are repairing water mains that are serving the densest part of our populations that are going to break, um, we think, uh, is, you know, are more vulnerable than others. Um, and at the same time, we are repairing roads and uh, making sure that utility companies do the same thing and hopefully, uh, at one point, also laying down broadband at the same time. Fantastic. I was going to say, that's a place I would love to get to because that makes so much sense when you look at what did happen in the city of Flint. You know, uh, we couldn't even do that because our, rep our records were on index cards spread throughout and they were very incomplete. And uh, so that's, it, it just makes so much sense and you can be so much more proactive that way. It's really about, I think for us, it was about saying, here's the resources that we do have and let's think about this problem in a in a way, let's not just say, well, we can't do this. And part of what I think in the discussion about infrastructure that thankfully when I first started talking about this, people were like, go away, Stephanie. Infrastructure's not sexy. You can't cut a ribbon on it. Nobody <laughs> wants to do anything about it. And now I'd like to say that we made infrastructure sexy because you know there's two women up here <laughs> talking about a traditional, uh, traditional environment where you don't see. Very um, well. And I, and I have told people, I don't like to say use me, but you know what I've said, you, if you don't use Flint, if you don't use us as a voice and a platform for what can happen in your city, then shame on you. Mm -hmm. Because what happened in Flint should never happen again. And if this is a way to bring this to the light and hear somebody that's doing something about it and using the data and using technology in a way that makes sense yeah. to address this, we, we've got to take this and people need to hear this. And because sure. ultimately, I think part of what we as cities believe and part Part of why we're all gathered here is we're doing the work and we're doing the innovation and bringing services to people and then it allows all of us to then turn to our state partners and our federal partners and say now what say you you got to join us in this right. effort mm -hmm. because you know when the water mains are breaking in february and rivers are running down the middle of the street in syracuse you can't find an elected official other than the mayor right, right? um That's and right. when you say to the state officials geez uh, you should be supporting this, and you used to at 23, you know, 23 cents 
um, or 23%, excuse me, they, they never would take that up on them. But now when you start to do this and when you use Flint as an example, and you say that if we want to build real economic development that helps everyone, we need to build the systems that everyone can benefit off of, and that's infrastructure. That's a good point. Our infrastructure, especially our water infrastructure in many cases, or in many of the American cities, is more than 100 years old. And as a consequence, it has all sorts of gaps and, 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 and shortcomings. Uh, how do you gather feedback from the population in a constructive manner, as opposed to bits and pieces that will just do the whining. So I laugh because any mayor will tell you that even before Facebook, our lives were Facebook. It's impossible to be a mayor and not gather feedback. Like that's all, the second you step out of your door in the morning until the second you lock yourself in at night, you're constantly gathering feedback. I think the, the challenge is to see, try to figure out a way to make it objective and use it in a way. So. We do that so we have all sorts of social media that we have embarked upon, but I've also challenged uh, my folks to, to remember that we have a significant portion in our city that don't have access to a computer um, because they don't have the resources to it, or they may have the resources, but they're older and senior citizens and they don't feel comfortable doing that. So we try to think of things in ways and platforms to use the standard lingo of making sure that everybody has a way into City Hall and a way to give their opinion. And then we, you know, we categorize those opinions and we, you know, try to make it both scientific and then the magic that mayors and elected officials, local elected yeah. officials, to try to make sense of what that means in the local context. Uh, in, in your I, case? I, well, I was going to say, you're, you're absolutely right. And one of the things, one of the good things uh, that's come out of this crisis, because something always good can come out of this, sure. is that the, the community is really speaking up now. Because one of the things that we know we got in this situation because people didn't speak up and they didn't speak out about what was going on in the city of Flint. And so the community is really speaking out now. And we've been going around. And, and while some people don't even want to come to City Hall, we've been taking City Hall out on the road and, and meeting with people and having old-fashioned kind of town hall meetings and just going out in neighborhoods and going to block clubs and talking to the people. Because you're right, through social media, we can always get that information. I'll wake up and somebody's taking a picture of something to send me on my phone to say, you need to come and look at this road. You need to come and look at this hole, those kinds of things. But the challenge is getting everybody else uh, uh, involved and engaged and so we've been really taking that on the road and ramping it up to talk to people about what do you need to see happen which way do we go yeah, yeah. and uh, you, you clearly mentioned the feedback from from the people how do you get the right people to make the right decisions together with <laughs> on that feedback you elect the right mayor <laughs> is how you do it I mean it's it's a it's I think that there's, we are at a really interesting time in local government that I will speak about, in that we have lots of young people who are really very interested in doing good work, doing public policy work, or engaged in trying to make their community better. And at the same time, we have really good uh, civil servants who have been there for a while and know the institution and have an institutional memory and will be there long after I'm mayor and were there before I was mayor. And it's the question of how you as a manager marry both of those things, to get people to take risks but to understand what they're taking risk for. And that's why data is so helpful to do this because you can then take a risk and you can measure it. And you can say, okay, that was a good risk. Let's continue on, or you can say, oh, that was a bad risk. Let's you know, yeah. change and pivot and move someplace else. And that's the part that we're missing, because we do have the young people. But when you look at what, what happens as a result of being under emergency manager, your staff is basically wiped out at City Hall. And so having the capacity to do those kinds of things is difficult. And having the people around that have that history and know what has happened and can give you that kind of information are really not there anymore. And so that's one of the challenges that we're facing. And that's that's what excites me so much about using the data and technology to help us move forward. Fantastic. So we talked a bit about how to prioritize projects. We talked a bit about, on how to get more out of the infrastructure that we have. Let me shift gears and, and touch upon a third dimension, which is the execution of new projects. Uh, every single leader that launches a project think that it's his, his or her project will be on time and on, on budget. And yet, evidence uh, says that most or the great majority of projects are over budget and over time. 
How do you do that? Okay, I think that that's a particular problem in the public sector because we always are, are we always want to go with the lowest lowest bidder, sure. and then the lowest bidder always cuts corners, and then you end up having these situations where people will say, "Well, we got to have change orders." I think that's where your institutional assets, the people that you have in your city who make these decisions, can really be just incredible resources. But you have to ask them, because particularly in a political environment, which we all live in, uh, oftentimes they're not going to volunteer unless, you, uh, unless they feel very safe with you. And so you have to establish this culture where they feel safe telling you bad news, and they feel safe warning you. And I try to do that by making sure I protect them and say to them, look, just tell me. And then we can figure out, I'm, I never am going to shoot the messenger or yell at the messenger. I want to solve the problem. So, and we can't solve the problem until I know it's a problem. And the sooner you know it's a problem, the easier it is for all of us to solve. You know, and that's interesting. You were talking about the contracts and putting things out for bid. Ours was people had stopped putting things out for bid in the city of Flint. We had not had any new contracts. We were just renewing contracts, renewing contracts, and not getting the best cost for things. And that's something that we've started doing, is saying we can't just continue with these no-bid contracts. We've really got to look at what we're spending, and are we getting the best bang for our buck? And so that's something we've started doing now, is putting things out for bid. Uh, just a month and a half ago, we put something out for bid, and the company that had been that already had the contract came down $2 million immediately. And <laughs> it's like, why didn't we do this sooner is what people wanted to know. And so that's what we've been looking at, at on the other hand. Sure. Well, it shows you there's no easy answer. It's right. about Absolutely. working Absolutely. within the context of your particular culture. There's certainly not easy answers, but I think the attitude point and the, the point of engaging people would go a long way, even in the private sector, mm -hmm. I, I have to say. Uh, Another point around executing projects in, in, in cities is the disruption that it will cause to people's lives. Any thoughts on any experiences on that, especially in the two cases? Well, it's, you know, it's inevitable in a city that you're always going to have something going on that's going to cause disruption. And what we try to do is we aim to give people notice, and we aim to give them lots of information. So they may be irritated, they may be disruptive, but they understand what is going on so that they don't just open their door in the morning and see, you know, 12 workers digging up the street and saying to them, sorry, you can't get your car out of the driveway. Um, and, you know, and that has its own challenges too because oftentimes you're working with the private sector and you're working with the public sector and you're trying to time things and the construction season in Syracuse is very short so you'll have contractors who want to bounce very quickly and if they bounce quickly it's great because you're saving money but on the other hand you may have inconvenienced, you know, 25 people who live on a street and that can't pull in and out of their driveways. So I always feel like error on the point of error on giving them as much information as possible so they understand why you're making the decisions you're making. And how to adjust their pr personal lives to that. Yeah, you know, and, and that's so interesting because you're absolutely right because you do have people that are angry. But I guess with what's happened in Flint, this is the first time people are just excited and clapping. When are you coming to our neighborhood to tear it up and put new pipes in? So we're, we're excited about that part. But this is one of the areas where we can actually be proactive instead of reactive as we're doing these things. We're looking at, okay, since we are going in and we are tearing up, can we do broadband now? Can we say, okay, how are we going to do these curbs? How are we going to fix this sidewalk? What are we going to do with these, this green space? How are we going to fix it? in the most up-to-date way now that we're there. If, if consumers is coming in and they're doing new gas lines, can we do some things at the same time now? And so while most of our uh, infrastructure um, movement has been reactive, that's the area that we can be proactive. So that part is exciting for us. That's fantastic, fantastic. So you two mentioned the challenges of funding, the challenges of execution, the challenges of Getting, getting the right stakeholders involved. Under what conditions do you involve uh, the private, uh, private sector into this? Well, there, you know, they are, in, in my city, the private sector owns the utility lines. And um, so they're always involved in that kind of discussion. You know, the private sector wants to get involved when there are, you know, public-private partnerships and if there's an entity that produces revenue. You see right. a lot of that. Um, right. and, but um, there's been, for me, I've always said, said, look, 
we cannot think that pro private public partnerships are going to solve the infrastructure problem. The government has a role in building these systems. That's how we became the country that we are, and that's how we have to move to the next century. And so, uh, as, as an advocate, I will say to all of you, I am glad that your city, that you are city focused, but do not let state and federal leaders off the hook for meeting their responsibilities. But you know what, that is so funny you said that because you're absolutely right. And, and with what's happened in Flint, it's been very interesting for the, the private sector and when we're meeting with different philanthropic groups because they said, we really want to help you fix some pipes. But we know that's not our responsibility. That's the government's responsibility. And so they've kind of, okay, here are some of the other things we can do because there is a role for them. But they have, they've been torn just because of the crisis that's facing the city. And I, I remember talking with one person said, well, we could give you this amount for, for infrastructure. But if we do that, we know we're letting people off the hook. We're letting the state and federal government off the hook from living up to their responsibility, and we can't do that. So what are some other ways we can work together? Because we know that's the only way we're going to move, you know, get things going the way we need them to in the city of Flint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So well, any, given that our time is, is coming to a close, maybe any advice for the mayors, not only here but elsewhere, on how they should enhance the productivity of the assets that they already have, how they should prioritize new projects, and how they should execute beyond the points that we talked about? My experience has been, don't think that just because it's a traditional <laughs> problem that hasn't been solved, it can't be solved. And I can tell you that I believe that data and technology has kind of skipped government. And the opportunity in that is that we can now plug into that, and that can really help us make very efficient and effective decisions. So um, hire very smart people and some who are familiar with data um, and call my office, and we'll share what we know with you. There you go. And I was, I was going to say, do whatever you're going to tell them, because like I said, use us as the example. Use us as the example and use us as your voice and say what happened in Flint can't happen in our cities and, and demand that we are making the investments in maintaining infrastructure. Uh, not only maintaining but investing in it. Make sure you use our voice as one to demand higher water quality standards. Those are things we should be taking for granted that we haven't done. Even use us when you talk about technology. Say Flint wasn't there and they had things on cards, on index cards, and we had to go to uh, University of Michigan and Kettering and uh, have them use their, their mapping system to help us even identify where the lead service lines were. And it's terrible, I'm saying use us because they, we were like the perfect storm of what could go wrong. And so don't let people forget what happened in Flint as the reason to be able to do what they're doing in Syracuse and why those investments are so important. Absolutely, Fantastic. absolutely. <laughs> This is a fascinating topic, and we touched upon a number of issues. Uh, thank you very much for your insights thank you, thank you. And, and, and consideration. Obviously, we don't have time to cover, but, uh, cover all the topics and all the solutions, but I hope this was, was uh, a, good, a good example uh, to raise awareness of the issue, that we need to reverse the trend in infrastructure investment and provide you with a few ideas on how to address those topics. Thank you. Thank you.